بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عرض الله جورنا وجوركم بمصابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام We were saying yesterday that something has gone on prior to this and as a result we are here and I want to develop this particular theme and also respond to some of the questions that come through of course from inquiring minds and that's a good sign it shows you weren't asleep and you were listening I don't get that often in my lectures. So we have this verse from the Qur'an, and I'm going to recite a couple of verses and then get into the topic. Surah Jathiyya, verse 22. وَخَلَقَ خَلَقَ اللَّهُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْعَرْضِ بِالْحَقِّ وَلِتُجْزَى كُلُّ نَفْسِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُذْبَغُونَ And Allah has created the heavens and the earth with the truth, so that every soul can be recompensed in accordance with what it has earned and they will not be oppressed or not be deprived in the least. The question comes here that these nufus, these souls who make it to this world through birth, they don't have an idea of what is day of Qiyamah, where they are headed to, or what is the truth that God is talking about. Obviously this in itself implies that there is some truth that we are supposed to be cognizant of, aware of something that is going on. And even if we are not, the verse intrigues us into thinking. Thank you. The verse intrigues us into thinking that something is going on. Now look at the verse of Surah Ahqaf number 3. And we have not created the heavens and the earth and what is between the two saved by the truth. Illa bil wajili musamma and the appointed time so this verse is telling us that there is heaven and the earth created in truth and there's an appointed time. You're all going to be rushed. You're ushered to an appointed time. What is this appointed time? I don't know anything about it. This is the story of 8 billion people on the face of this earth right now. And the people who are in denial are totally averse to whatever has, is being said to them. They look, think about it. Something is going on. Now, we have to awaken. Something is there. This life is not as simplistic as we have understood it to be. And there's a reason why this memory, recollection, has been effaced from our minds. And we need to work out possibly why we don't remember. We have to understand that the Quran is trying to awaken us. But we have to also ask this question. Our memories have gone, and yet the Quran is insisting that you have to awaken. Well, why is that? What is actually going on? So yesterday we speculated that according to the adamant tone of the Quran that you must believe in one God and acknowledge that you're returning to Him and deny association with God shows that there has been something that we may be guilty of. And this world, for it to be a bestowal and a gift from God, it can only make sense if we are here to make atonement of something, <coughs> turn back to God, reclaim our position with God. Yesterday we cited those verses, O Lord, complete our light for us. And we cited that verse where Adam says, O Lord, I have darkened my soul. And darkening of the soul is removal from God. And Adam's darkening of the soul resulted from Adam's desire for an ending kingdom and a life that means no death. So Adam's, Adam coveted an ending life. He, co he wanted an ending, an, en an ending kingdom. And that greed in Adam, which is of course in all of us, has somehow done something to us. Now there, there is a story, I believe, even before Adam's consumption of fruit and Adam consumed the fruit directly as a consequence of what had happened prior to Adam's state of embodiment. But we'll see if we can venture into that area of inquiry somewhat. But the Quran gestures that there is a deeper reality. You are not existing in the right world for a reason. Now it teases our minds. So for example, Surah Naam, verse 75. وَكَذَلِكَ نُورِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْعَرَضِ وَلَيْ يَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we showed Abraham 
the spiritual, because I don't have a better word to translate this, Malakut, the angelic, the spiritual reality of the heavens and the earth, so that he may be of those who bear certitude. And then you get this verse in Surah Kaf, verse 22, لَقَدْ كُنْتَ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ هَذَا فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَأَصْرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٍ When a person dies, the verse says, you, now that you've died, now you see everything. You are actually in denial of this reality. We have taken the veils off your eyes. And now your sight is as sharp as a blade. Now you can see. And that's when those verses come, where we talked of yesterday, that people will plead with the divine, that now we see, now we hear, send us back. We will behave righteously. This life is extremely important. God sees it as a bestowal and as a gift. Somebody went to the Blessed Prophet and he said to the Blessed Prophet that I no longer wish to live. And the Prophet said, don't say that. Don't ask God for that. Ask God for prolonging of life. There is something here for you. Then the Prophet said, finally, if you actually want to make a prayer, if you become that tired of life, then say to Allah, O Lord, keep me alive for as long as my life is good for me in your eyes. Take away my life when my life becomes a source of alienation from you. He said, if you have to pray for that, then pray in this way. Do not pray any other way. Do not ask for a death. Don't ask for the hastening of that prolonged life. It's good for you. Now we also said that humanity is one reality. Prior to becoming embodied 8 billion people, we are just one reality. That's why the Quran says, he who slays a soul has killed humanity in its entirety. And he who gives life to a soul has given life to humanity in their entirety. Now the question came from yesterday, and I'll just go through it as we advance, that how can you say that there was a life prior to this? When this is the only life we know, and isn't this reincarnation? Now in technical terms, reincarnation means that when a seed germinates, this is an example, and becomes a full-fledged tree, that tree is reduced to a seed once again, and that's an impossibility. A fetus takes birth, grows into a ripe old individual, and then they die. And then they cannot be reduced to point zero again. That is reincarnation, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a progressive trend. Now, when we die from the, in this world, what happens to us? We go into another phase of life, don't we? The Prophet said, do not consider death as destruction. You are simply being transferred from one abode to another. Now, a very renowned Shia scholar, Mullah Mohsin Fais Kashani, the son-in-law of Mullah Sadra, but he was a philosopher mystic. He was a mystic, then a philosopher, as opposed to Mullah Sadra, who was a mystic philosopher. Now, he obviously was amongst grand mystics, and he was Sheikh of Islam in the Safavid era. Now, if you read some of his books, and I don't remember which particular book in which he states this, he says, when you die, the spiritual DNA starts working. And before you're resurrected, your spiritual DNA will mature fully. And you will come out of your grave in a form that is befitting your spiritual dispositions. So if you are demonic in this earth and you die, on this earth and you die, then you arise as a full-fledged demon, possibly. And if you are angelic, like the person talks with you, then you will take birth as an angel in the next world. Nobody acknowledges anything. No, you have to read Salwat, not laugh. Okay, I, I didn't mean that. But thank you for the generosity. So now, in the womb, just as the physical DNA starts working and shaping the features, the limbs, the organs of a fetus, in the womb that is to come after that, the spiritual DNA that is within us starts maturing, evolving. And that is why we have this hadith by the Blessed Prophet that on the day of Qiyamah people will be raised in accordance of, 
in accordance with the forms that are befitting their characteristics that they acquired in this world. If they were good people, obviously they will arise as lights, angelic beings. If they were bad people, then they will arise in accordance with the most prominent trait. Angry person will arise in a form befitting. So he said, you will see people, I mean, I'm talking about the prophetic hadith and the imams, they will appear in forms of beasts. His wife obviously asked him, well, how will we recognize each other? He said, no, you will recognize the souls as you recognize each other by face here. You will recognize the souls in that world. So it's not a very strange idea that we are presenting. The world prior to this determines our status here. This world determines our status and form in the next one. We've taken one birth in this world in accordance with what we, what we, what we have done in another realm. We will take another birth in another realm in accordance with the forms that we have acquired here. Of course, the journey does not stop with the resurrection. The journey does not even stop at hell. The journey doesn't even stop at paradise. Even in the seventh tier of paradise, the journey just does not stop. And that's another inquiry that we will uh, conduct at some point, and maybe in these talks we will hint at that. So now, Imam Ali says, Anasu niyam in matu in tabahu. People are in a state of slumber. When they die, they awaken. Yes? It's just like my madness, you know, people sleep and when I finish, they awaken. <laughs> but the Quran is constantly trying us, trying to tell us to awaken. Quran is prompting us, awaken, something is going on. Now this awakening, I need you to open your smart devices and come through with me in this talk and in this journey that we're going to take today. Quran is saying you need to awaken. Now the Quran is prompting this awakening at several different levels. The first level that the Qur'an hints at, of course, the Qur'anic verses are scattered in those surahs that we have in the compiled version. It is not in a chronological manner, but I would advise go and read the Qur'an in its chronological order and you will see how these verses appear one after another and you will see the relevance of their positioning within the chronological order. So the first verse that I want you to look and this is something that Quran expects us, expects us to have recorded historically, but it's not been recorded. Surah Araf, which is surah number 7, verse 172-173. Now I need all of you who are here with smart devices to look at, oh it's there, okay. Now this verse says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتُهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ And when your Lord took from the children of Adam, so it's not from Adam, it's from the children of Adam, so it's not purely pre-worldly, but it is pre-existence at present. From the children of Adam, from their loins, their progenies, future progenies, and he held them to witness upon themselves. Allah to be Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Am I not your Lord? He said to them. Alu Bala. They said, yes, indeed you are our Lord. Shahidina, we bear witness. Then the Quranic verse continues on behalf of the Lord who is speaking. Least you say on the day of Qiyamah that we were unaware of this. Can you see what is happening here? Least you say on the day of Qiyamah we were unaware of this. I've taken this commitment of you, I've made you witnesses to this pledge that you're making with me. You have taken, you have borne witness here that we acknowledge you are our Lord. On the day of Qiyamah, you will not be able to complain to me that you did not know about this or you were not aware. But look at the second verse. Out of Udu, innama ashraka abana. آباؤنا من قبل وكنا ضرية من بعدهم أفتهلكنا بما فعل المبتلون or at least you say on the day of Qiyamah that our forefathers committed shirk and we were just their progenies and it is natural to expect the progeny to follow their predecessors isn't that what happens? we follow the cultures and the belief systems and everything of our forefathers 
And it's a very legitimate argument. So they're saying, God is saying, least you tell me, I was unaware, or that you tell me, our forefathers associated with you, we were their children, what are we expected to do but to follow them? Will you destroy us due to what our parents have done? So here the rub is cutting off all roots and all excuses. Look, you are bearing witness. With that bearing of witness, we are cutting off two escape routes from you. One is, I was unaware. Two is, what was I supposed to do? I was naive, I was just a child in the cradle and I followed my parents' beliefs and grandparents' beliefs systems. We don't know of this oath. It's not been recorded historically. Not within our literature. If you look at the broader literature, Yes, non-Abrahamic literature, yes. Don't ask me where, though, uh, this time around. <coughs> then, look at Surah Ahzab, 3372. Inna aradna al-amana al-samawati wal-ard wal-jibab fa'abayna yahbilna wa ashfaqna minha We offer our trust to the heavens and the earth and to the mountains. They refuse to bear the trust and they were petrified of it. They were frightful of it. Muhammad al insan. But man or insan. Insan is a very broad term in the Quran, by the way. I'm going to deal with it if Allah gives life in the years to come. But insan bore the trust. Look at what the Quran says. Inna hukana dhaluman jahula. Insan is oppressive and ignorant. It is as if it was not forced onto the insan. It was offered and insan took it. And the Lord is saying, or the Quran is saying, you are oppressive and foolish, you shouldn't be taking this. But I, we have taken it now. Yes? It is there. Insan, not Adam, insan. But just to clarify, that when the trust was offered to the earth and the mountains, it doesn't mean the earth as a physical solid earth and the solid mountains, it means the inhabitants of the earth and the inhabitants of the mountains who are offered this trust. They said, no, this is too grand of a task. But Insan said, no, I'll take it. In fact, Insan, Insan was insistent that I want it. And why shouldn't Insan be insistent? Because there is something phenomenal waiting at the end of the road, if only we knew. In any case, if you've seen these two verses, then you can again see the verse from Surah Yasin. Did I not take a pledge from you, O children of Adam? Not Adam, children of Adam that you will not be worshipping the shaitan. Did I not? This is the day of Qiyamah. Did I not? Now here, we will say, well, I don't remember any of it. It's not been recorded. True, it's not been recorded in our literature. But look at what happens next in the Quran. Turn to Surah Fajr, uh, Surah 89, verse 23 and 24. Turn to it. Look at it yourselves. Or, or turn to the screen, sorry. It is narrating the Omul Qiyam, of course. What I'm presenting is inconsistent with what the likes of Mullah Sadr and others are saying. Yeah? Uh, but this is my understanding at face value. وَجِيهَ يَوْمَ يَدِنْ بِجَهَنَّمْ The hell will be brought on that day. يَوْمَ يَدِنْ يَتَذَكَّرَ الْإِنسَانِ On that day, insan will remember. And in despair, he will cry out, if only I had set forth something for my life. This verse is giving us a hint of two or three things. The first thing is, they will remember that pledge made to God initially. Can you see that? They will remember that they were supposed to meet with their God. The second thing the verse is saying is that they will become cognizant and mindful that this dunya was not the real life. That was a real life, it was just an illusion. And the Quran actually hints at this life being an illusory life. It's not a real life. So even though these oaths were supposed to be written down and supposed to be carried through in popular memory and narrations and whatever they have been, but still the Quran is cutting off all roots of excuse. They say no, there is something in there still. Even though you don't find it in writing, there is something in there still. They should be acknowledging the truth of what has happened. It is inbuilt within your human existence. 
It is there innate within you. You need to awaken to it. The knowledge has been effaced. And I'm going to come to that afterwards. So these are verses that are talking about the pledges that have been made in the past. Now look at these verses that we are supposed to reflect, become mindful and awaken from within. It's a constant demand of the Qur'an. Afala yatadabbarun al-Qur'an. Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? Afala yaqilun. Do they not reason? Fiha ayatun yawulil al-Bab. In there are signs for the people of reasoning. Now look at, I'm, I'm, I'm being obviously selective. Surah Hashia, Surah 22, verses 17 to 21. Look at this verse. Do they not see the camel, how it's been created? What's the point of saying this? Do they not see the camel, how it's been created? Have we ever looked at the camel, reflected upon the camel? Look at the way it's adapted to its environment. It's a perfect creature for that hostile environment. It can walk within the sand dunes. It has water because oases are far and apart. It has that neck where it can rise above the sandstorms. It has heavy eyelid which protects it from sand. Do they not see the camel? How it's been created? And at the Mountains, how they are packed in and raised. You know, now we know that what keeps the earth's tectonic plates a little bit stable are these packed in mountains. It's not only addressing the audience at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, it's addressing all of our minds until the day of Qiyamah. And at the earth, how it's been spread beautifully and scientifically, we'll start understanding this. But the end of this verse, comes this verse, Remind them. You are there as a reminder. Remind them that something is going on. Open up your minds, open your hearts, begin to understand, begin to think, awaken. Then Surah Al-Imran, verses 190 to 192. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard wa layl wa nahar la ayatin la ulil al Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the changing of the night and the day are signs for the people of reckoning. You know, we were never meant to just sit here and let days pass by. Human being was always meant to sit and reflect, to try to understand who am I and what is going on. <laughs> then the verse continues, it's beautiful. The people who remember Allah standing, sitting and on their sides and who reflect on how the heavens and the earth have been created. They're supposed to be filled with wonder. How is it all running so meticulously? Everything is in place. From the mammoth stars that are outside there, the clusters of galaxies, now we are saying there are two, two trillion galaxies there out there. Two trillion galaxies, can you imagine? In this Milky Way, which is a, a humbly small, sort of a mediocre, medium sized or smaller sized galaxy, we have how many, how many stars? Does anybody know? 400 billion stars, possibly. 400 billion. You know, we fight for this world. If each one of us had a star and ten planets around it, there are still more stars and planets out there. If each one of us had a galaxy, there are still more galaxies out there. We are eight billion. There are two trillion galaxies out there to the best of our sunny and present, of course. And there are many, many, many more. And they think, they remember Allah, and they think, into the creation of heaven and the earth, they look at the ant, they look at the trees, they look at the sailing ships, they look at the mass of the wood and the water and how everything is balanced. In any case, guess what happens? At that point, there is a sudden awakening in their souls. And they cry out, Rabbana ma khalatta hadha batila. Our Lord, you have not created this in vain. They come to that point of enlightenment. There is a sudden realization deep within their souls. That awakening comes at that point. Remembering of God and reflecting 
on nature, constantly asking questions, constantly reflecting. And at that point comes this point of realization, sudden realization. Subhanaka, faqina ghabab nar glory be to you, save us from the fire of hell. Now imagine, imagine, they're also making this conclusion, you have not created anything in vain, and they're also concluding that there is something to come. So that enlightened state brings in that memory, recollection of what has been forgotten. Oh Allah, whoever you give to the fire, you have indeed abased them. And your oppressive people have no helpers. So you come to that realization through reflection. Now, as for the people who fail to reflect, who fail to awaken, Surah Taha 125, 126. So people are resurrected on the day of Qiyamah. And there is a person who cries out, Rabbi, Lima hasharti a'ma wa kad kuntu masira. My Lord, why have you raised me blind when I used to be able to see? The response comes from the divine. Ta'ala kadalik ateita karayatuna. Our signs came to you to wake you up. Fanasitaha. And you forgot them, tunsa, and today you have been forgotten. You are blind to the truth, and you have been raised blind. Imagine what is at stake here. We are required to awaken. Now, I'm going to pose this question. It's going to be a little bit challenging. You know, every person of faith will say, well, I am on the truth, and nobody will bother thinking. So the Muslims will say, this, the verse of who is blind doesn't involve the Muslims. And then the Christian can make the same argument. The Jew can make the same argument and the Hindu can make the same argument and so on and so forth. Every faith can make the same argument that our religion, the way we are following it, is us opening our eyes. I don't think that's what the verse means. Yes, God is most merciful. We'll go into it later on that He will forgive one and all. But there is a danger here. This awakening is not the one that we have understood. That I am saying there is one God and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger and then following uh, their commandments and I'm praying and I'm fasting and all of that. No, he's talking about a deeper sense of awakening. You see, when we look at the signs of, when we look at the verses talking about the day of Qiyamah, we are seeing people as we see them here today like ourselves. There are people who are saintly and there are people who are just content with their fruits and rivers of honey and milk and whatever there is. Those are the people who need to truly awaken from within. People like us need to awaken from within because we have reached the apple trees but we have not reached our truth. God is still veiled from us and for a person endowed with insight, paradise becomes no less than imprisonment, captivity, and no less than hell, because it's devoid of the truth. So, uh, okay, I'm mindful of, the, uh, mindful of the time. Awakening through rational inquiry. This is another level of awakening that God expects of us. Surah Al-An, 76, 78. Now this is a story about Abraham when he conducts a rational inquiry about what war should be. And when night spread its garment, he saw the star. He said, this is my Lord. And when it set, he said, I don't like anything that sets. Look at Ibrahim's mind. His rational inquiry is, oh, if this is the Lord, then it should be ever vigilant and present. If it fades away, that means it's not watching over its creation. So it can't be my Lord. It's a very simple rational inquiry. And when he sees the moon rising with its full splendor, he says, this is my God, my Lord. And when it said, he said, if my Lord doesn't guide me, I will be from the people who are misled. And when he sees the sun rising, 
with his luminosity. He says, this is my Lord, this is bigger. And when it said, he says, oh my people, I am free of all the associations that you are making. This is the awakening through reason. But have you noticed the tonality? Tushrikun, shirk. Shirk is playing a very important role in all these verses. That shirk is a problematic area. Something has happened somewhere. We want to build on this in the next few days. But in any case, awakening through faith. Surah Al-Ghabun, verse 11. مَا سَبَ مِنْ مُسِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ No tribulation befalls you, say, by the consent of God. Now imagine this verse. Imagine this verse. God has consented for this tribulation to fall upon you. There is a reason why this tribulation has befallen you. And God is just, God is merciful and not oppressive. So there is a deeper reason why you have become ill, why you have become sick, why people are nasty, why the whole of this world should go to hell. You know, that's how we feel sometimes, don't we? Everybody is just a nasty piece of work. Well, there's a reason for it. In any case, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَحْدِي قَلْبًا But the one who brings faith in God, Allah will direct his heart. Now, it is here where the faithful community needs to ask. Faithful community needs to ask, have I actually believed in Allah to the extent that He is now guiding my heart to the truth? To this level of awakening? Now, obviously we are all, Alhamdulillah, good people and Allah will take mercy on all of us and we are on the journey trying to understand. But these verses are there to prompt us to reflect. You know, there is an inner guide there. Is my inner guide guiding me to awakening to the greater truth, to the malakut that Abraham understood? Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim, and Allah knows all things. In any case, finally, the Quran had a strategy of its own. Now, this is conveyed in the actions of the Blessed Prophet. Now, if you look at Surah Jumu'ah, verse number 2, and let's work through this one like, slightly slowly. He is the one who sent amongst the Ummis, the unlettered one, all the people of the central village, a messenger amongst them. Now look at the sequence of this verse. Yetlu alayhim ayatihi, who recites upon them his sign. I'm going to come back to it. Where you him and he purifies them. Where you al wal hikmah. And then he teaches them of the book and endows them with wisdom. When kanum in qabliri lafi baladin mubin. And even though before this point, they were in open misguidance. Now, now, now. Let's look at before and after the Sahab of the Prophet. And then we work through this verse. Now when Jafar went to Abyssinia, when the Quraysh sent their own emissaries and said, look, these are fugitives and send them back. So the king of Habsha asked Jafar, who is this messenger? He said, we were warring people, dirty people. We used to eat dead carcasses. We used to worship God. We were superstitious. We did not understand human value, morals, human rights. He told us to be clean. He told us to break idols and turn to one God. He told us to honor our pledges and our oaths. He told us to be good to one another. He told us to take care of our parents. He told us to eat clean food. The king of Absha said that he must be the messenger. Now before they were that, and now they have become this, so there was a full transformation. After the Prophet preached what he preached, but there is a way in which he did it. That's what we want to explore in a little while. Now, if you look at Imam Ali's quote by Najibullah, he often appears to be complaining to the people of Kufa who are on his side. And on an occasion he says, why do I not see the likes of the companions of the Prophet amongst you? You are like bent bows. I spent a whole, I spent a whole day straightening you out. By night you are as bent as you were in the morning. He said, the Sahaba of the Prophet, they used to stand vigilantly at nights, remembering God and praying to God. Their foreheads bore witness to their prostrations. Their lips were dry 
through the remembrance of God. Their stomachs were stuck to their backs through hunger. They were the most righteous people. So that was a transformation the Prophet made in his own community of Mecca, the early Muslims. Now what was the strategy? The Prophet recited upon them the ayat of Allah. Now what are these ayat? Now go back to the chronological Quran, the way it was revealed. The chronological Quran, it's stern in its tone. It's talking about the warning of hell. What will happen? What drove you to the pits of hell? Ma kunna lamna kumina musaleen. We never prayed. We never gave poor anything from our share. We used to mock about the hereafter. Those verses were so shocking. The day in which mountains shall crumble, the graves will explode, the seas will be set alight, the days in which people will be scattered like moths. These were frightening verses. These were the signs of God that the Prophet recited and even today they work. When you recite those verses, Every wet nursing woman will become confused of her child. Every pregnant woman will miscarry her baby. Every person will appear drunkard. Every child will become old. When we recite those verses, they are shocking. This shock that the Prophet gave to them in the early verses of the Quran, early surahs of the Quran recited in its chronological order, they are frightening. What this fear did to them was it shook them from the very core. And it forced them to say, no, I better take caution. Enough of this heedlessness. Once that thing happened and they became receptive, you key him. He began to purify them. You know, there's a whole process to this awakening. This purification came through. Now, don't lie. Don't cheat. Be mindful of the rights of others. Become caring. Become forgiving. Be humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be so arrogant. And say, you know, we have such a lot of arrogance in us. I have done nothing wrong. So why would God do wrong to me? You should say this what the Prophet said. That I cannot secure salvation for myself through my own devotions and my own works. I am not worthy of it unless Allah takes pity on me. If our great Prophet is saying that, isn't there something in there for us to awaken to? Humble yourselves. That's what the Quran is saying. Humble and we'll see this in the lectures to come. That humility before God is the actual secret. In any case, he recites the verses. Then he purifies them. Once they are purified, they become ripened. Once they are ripened, then he teaches the book. That is when the book means something. Otherwise, people like me will memorize the Quran and just recite verses and verses and verses. But he doesn't do anything in there. This thing is empty here. Yeah? It's only coming from here. Allahu Akbar is only on my lips. But when I say Allahu Akbar, the whole being is supposed to tremble. Who am I talking about? The thunder and the lightning proclaim His glory. And the malaika in awe of Him a glorified name. His heart seems to be humbled before him. And that's why the Quran says, and the people who believe, when the verses of God are recited, they tremble at the mention of God. Their hearts are humbled. This is when the verses are inscribed upon the slate of the heart and the mind. Not the way I am receiving them right now. Because that process of awakening has not been there. The process of purification has not been there. Once that is done, then you come to teaching of the book and that's when book, its content starts working inside. And he endows them with penetrative insight into the affairs, how it is all working so beautifully. You know the blessed prophet, look at the height of his wisdom. Look at the height of his wisdom. You know what he says? 
He was a physician that was curing the ailments of humanity. He saw people who were burying their daughters. Do you know this? This is where he is born. He converts those people, transforms them into the best of human beings. How did he do that? He was endowed with that godliness, with that patience, with that wisdom, where he saw the community and he said, it's our story. He realized that even if a single person fails, the whole humanity has failed. So that wisdom comes in at the last level when a, prof, when a person becomes quite saintly and they become endowed with that knowledge. Now we are asking, and I want to ask this important question, what is the reason for the effacement of this memory of ours? Why are we to struggle to regain this awareness and understanding that something is happening and we need to be aware of it and humble ourselves to it and this life is not to be led for itself. You know, and I'm going to just take you in there that I used to read a verse of the Quran and the people who do things in order to show others their deeds are like dust gathered upon surface of a rock. When they return to retrieve it, a gust of wind comes and blows it all away. And they are in a frenzy to try and catch anything they can. But loss and sorrow is their state. Sorrowful is their state. And I used to read this verse. And it was after many years I awoke and I said, no, this is talking about me. It's not talking about the Kafir or anybody. It's talking about me. You know, think about it. I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this much work. I'm doing that much work. I'm doing all this. It's good. It's commendable. And Allah will reward and we'll talk about it afterwards. But the thing is, I'm still afraid of death. How does that make sense? Does that really make sense? I pray five times a day. Yeah? In those five times a day, in every one rakat, I prostrate twice. I'm saying, Subhana Rabbi Allah Allah. In every one of those prayers, twice I'm saying, Iya ka na'abudu wa iya ka nasta'in. I'm giving myself over to my God wholesomely. I'm saying, I'm yours. Five times a day I'm doing this. And I'm afraid of death. Can that make sense? These good deeds are like that dust collected on the, on the surface of the rock. At the time of desperation, I turn to it. It all flies away. I have no confidence in my God. The real one that is there doesn't mean anything. It's just lip service I'm paying to him. Surely, forgive me for saying this, surely it's better for me to stop going to mosques so frequently and start inviting the light of God in there. Isn't it? I'm going to mosques so often, the only thing that is missing from the mosque in my heart is my God. That's not true. Uh, you know, you're okay. So I'm just saying about, my, about me. Think about these things very carefully. Think about these things very carefully. Look at the state of the son of Adam. I know I'm carrying burdens on my shoulders, and I know this. Guess what I don't know? If I'm going to be given the next breath. Imagine the precarious situation of this soul. Who knows the burdens he is carrying. He doesn't know the next minute will be given to him. And still heedlessly he goes about his life. Do the heavens lament upon me or do they laugh mockingly at me? So I realized that these verses are not for them, they are for me. It's talking about me. Another verse, and when their ship is caught in stormy waters, they turn to God and they plead with him, imploring him that if you were to sail us to the shores of safety, we will not associate with you. And as they find safety, they quickly forget. And I realize that it's me. This is, this is the stormy water in which I am. And this is the illusory shore of safety on which I am. The one who could have taken me in the stormy waters can take me right now, at any minute. There is no difference. It's a joke. I am within the depth of the ocean right now. My ark is about to wreck. I'm about to drown. Why is there no desperation and emergency and urgency in me 
to awaken. So why are the memories effaced? It is not take a philosophical twist now. Think about it. Now obviously, this is me, okay, assuming and presuming and, 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 and maybe it's totally wrong. If, and let's go into a futuristic world, if somebody has committed a crime, and they go to the judge and they say, you know what, I would never do it again. And the judge lives in an era a thousand years from today where human beings are far more moral and far more refined. They don't like, they don't like putting people in dungeons and prisons. They don't like flogging people or punishing and retribution and all that because that would be below our dignity at that point. So the judge will say, that in that case, I'm willing to give you a second chance. I'll put you in the same situation again. Let's see if you repeat what you're doing or not. Now for that to be a true test, I'm just giving a hypothetical scenario. For that to be a true test, what needs to be done first? The memory of the original crime has to be removed. Because if the memory of the original crime is there, then the thing is that that person, with the benefit of that memory, is behaving superficially. It's not a real test. So in order for that to be a proper test, as it's a hypothetical sort of, uh, it's my speculation, yes? For that to be a proper test, you have to remove the memory. And then say, okay, now you're in the same scenario. And that is why you are seeing people on the day of Kerala saying, now we see, now we hear, let us go back and we will behave righteously. And in one verse it says, that it, the response comes, no, if you go back, you'll do the same thing again. Because you've done it previously as well. If we send you back, you will do the same thing. It's an unending cycle with you. You are not awakening. As I said, I'm speculating, yes? It's not the word of God. Although I'm saying the figure, there might be some truth in that. Good, you got that word. But think about these things. Think about them deeply. In any case, we are meeting with God according to the book of God. It is filled with two things. Unity of God, removal of shirk, and meeting with God. The message of the Quran, in terms of our purpose, aside from becoming righteous, which is integrated in this message, there are two things. Oneness of God, removal of association, and meeting with God. We either meet with our bodies, or we can either meet with our souls. If we meet Him with our bodies, the verse says, God will not look at them. He will not speak with them and it will not purify them. If we meet with him with an attempt to really meet with him from there, then the verse says, they will plead to Allah and say, Allahumma atrim lana nur, Rabbana atrim lana nurana. O Lord, complete for us our light, so that meeting becomes a full meeting. Now that is at stake here. We need to think through this. Look at this blessed Hussein Ghali, how he has progressed in the meeting of God, and we will discuss these things in the days to come. In his prayer, uh, it's stated that this is his prayer of the day of Ashura, from what I recollect. Allahu Manta, Muta'ali al-Makan, Azim al-Jabarut, Husn al-Bala, O Lord, grand are you in your rank, majestic are you in your loftiness. You bring the best trials. What trials has this man gone through? The quenching of the thirst of his baby with an arrow. And he's saying, you are the one who plants the best trials. What does he say after that? Qareebun Mujib. O Lord, you are near. And you respond to every prayer of mine. Now it is here that I stop. And I say to Imam Hussein, which prayer has God responded to? He has taken your Abbas. He has taken your Akbar. He has taken your Asta. You refuse to die because you are afraid that they will captivate your Zainab. He has refused to even grant you that prayer. You are going to die. You are going to be killed. And they are going to be taken captive. Hussein, what are you talking about? Which prayer? 
Subhanallah, this man was in another world. He's saying, my prayer is only he. I had no prayer. My prayer was only he. He took Akbar to himself. Akbar belongs to him. It is a greater joy for Akbar to be with him rather than to be with me. That is how his soul radiates. And that is why they are saying that as he struggles for life and turns from side to side, we see serenities abound. We see his face radiating. We see his lips moving in the tasbih of Allah. The beauty that, a man, that emits from him distracts us from the thought of beheading him. Such is this man. He is asked, why do you go to Karbala? And I am just narrating Imam Hussein's sentiments through, 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 through popular narration. He says, because these people will not let me be. They will search me out in Medina and Makkah and put me to death. And I do not wish for the sanctity of Medina and Makkah to be violated by the spilling of my blood. I believe it's in the Abbas. Zainab calmly listens. And she's afraid of what Ibn Abbas is going to suggest. He says, Hussein, if you have to go, then go. Why do you take your daughters, your sisters, your children? As he asked this, Zainab would not control herself. She said, Ibn Abbas, do not ask such a question. Hussein needs me. She was filled with anxiety that at least my brother concedes to Ibn Abbas. But this is the popular narration that I narrate now. It's very moving. He said, why do you take your women? He said, in Allah, yurid an yara'unna sabaya. Allah wishes to see them captives. Why do you take your children? Allah wishes to see them scattered within the plains of Karbala. In any case, Imam Hussein writes a letter to the Hashimis. No, he who accompanies me will forfeit his life. And he who resists assisting me will not succeed. In a letter he writes in Makkah before going onward to his journey, it is known as the line of death. In which he says, he who is resolved And giving me support and has come to this understanding that he will give his life for Allah let him accompany me tomorrow for indeed I depart in the morning Hussein goes on he camps at a place people come from Kufa he asks them what news do you bring of Kufa one says their hearts are with you their swords are turned against you he waits, another one comes. He says, do you bring news of my brother Muslim? He has been beheaded together with Hani. Their bodies have been thrown from the roof to the ground. Their heads have been paraded and their bodies have been dragged around the streets. We hear from the Dakirin. Imam Hussein calls onto the young daughters of Muslim and begins to caress their heads and they begin to cry and they say, oh uncle what has happened to our father? he said, I am your father now little Sukain asks what does it mean, this word yatim? I was a Sakina it is when your garments catch fire when your earrings get snatched when your face gets slapped, when you call on to your father for help and there is no response. Hussein makes his way, meets with Ghor, who intercepts him. There are impasses on the way. Now Hussein says, Ghor, let us be and camp at the banks of the Euphrates. Imam Hussein is moving and I narrate from popular narration and convey the sentiments. The faithful steed of Imam Hussein refuses to move. Imam Hussein spurs his steed, but finds this behavior strange. 
He changes his teeth. The next horse also refuses to move. He turns to Zohair ibn Qayyim. He says, what is the name? He asks, what is the name of this place? He said, it is known as Taf. Does it have another name? Shatul Furat. Does it have another name? It is known as Karbala. Imam Hussein said, I seek refuge with God from Karb and Bala, from sorrow and tribulations. Then he dismounts and he has a spear in his hand. He embeds his spear within the nest of Karbala and says, By Allah, this is where our animals will stop. This is where our tents will be erected. This is where we will be torn into pieces. And from here shall we be erected on the day of Qiyamah. <laughs> Fatiha.